close. Oh, yeah, I got it. <clears throat> Okay, we're back in regular session. Uh, according to our agenda, we have um, our departmental reports, starting with finance. Evening, everyone. Um, five items uh, to report out on, uh, one on tonight's agenda, one uh, to discuss to be on the 25th agenda, uh, three <laughs> that deal with state aid and their budget. So first on the agenda tonight, we have a few budget transfers, uh, three transfers, they all stem from the same area. They're all dealing with our instructional materials aids. Our instructional material aids are a state aid pot of money, yet essentially you know, allocated by enrollment for the areas of hardware, software, library, and um, textbook. So three of those items, textbook, software, and hardware, the state allows you to allocate those through the year as you see fit uh, and still realize all the state aid monies for that grouping. So those transfers are to allocate to the area that we'll be spending this year. Uh, it's dollar for dollar aid. Uh, so it's kind of a, a use it or lose it aid stream. So we've reduced state aided software and the BOCI service you see there is in the area of textbook and transferred that money to state-aided hardware uh, for use for this year. Any questions on the budget transfers? And then upcoming for the 25th agenda, we're gonna have a uh, proposed resolution uh, dealing with our election districts. So if you remember uh, talking about our wards and our election districts, the election, what's historically been Ward 3, Rome City Hall, uh, won't be available to us for this May's vote, you know, due to COVID closure. So when we were looking at, you know, solutions for that, uh, kind of went back and studied the data, studied the turnout in the election districts. And what we found to propose was to combine Ward 3 and Ward 4 into one election district. Now that would be uh, what's historically Rome City Hall and what is Gansevoort. So that would be three and four. Uh, some points on that. Looking back at our last in-person vote, which would have been 1920, uh, Ward 3, which was City Hall, was our least used uh, voting ward, uh, had 64 in-person votes. Uh, so we think we can combine those and volume-wise be okay. There is some monetary savings. We estimate uh, an expectation of saving somewhere in the ballpark of $1,400, $1,500. Now that's, of course, we won't need one, you know, one less voting machine and one less a team of staff uh, for the voting location. Um, also school voting law, they want you to put them in school houses as practicable. So if we have a school house within an election district, they want us to look at using that first. So if Gansevoort, of course, uh, would cover that. Uh, in addition to kind of ease of communication. So instead of uh, splitting the ward or having some people go to this location or that location, it'll be kind of as straightforward as everyone that previously voted at Ward 3, previously voted at City Hall, would now vote at Gansevoort. So we're proposing to bring forth at the 25th meeting uh, election district resolutions to basically carry that out. Any questions on that area? Go ahead, John. Yes, I think it's John Nagish. Um, I brought this up at the Finance Committee meeting I just want to express my concern with moving the third ward up, the third ward at City Hall all the way to um, Gansevoort. I'm concerned about all the senior citizens that live around City Hall. My preference would be something closer to City Hall just to have that, but I just want to, you know, voice my objection to that. I have to agree. I, I, I mean, it's very difficult already because that ward extends very far south. It sends, you know, goes out to Oswego Road, you know, that's a long way to make people go. I know that I know that it should be a school, but the city uses the South Rome Senior Center. And I know that they were very accommodating to us with distributing lunches to that area. I would hate to see us deprive people of the ability to vote because we took their location out of their neighborhood. I don't know if there's an opportunity to split it or if it has to be one. Could we have a 3A and a 3B? Uh, you, you can do that. You can you know, have the election district lines drawn 
you know, essentially where the district chooses. Uh, or we could try to find another location within what's already considered Ward 3. Well, like, like you said, the senior center is the third ward. I know that for sure. Um, the Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Like, that's a lot to digest. Sorry. It's just, except, oh, my other question was, is the mail-in ballot option still going to be, or a drop-off here, is that going to continue this year? Uh, currently, it's back to what I call old absentee ballot law. So it's not the full mail-in of 2021. Uh, absentee ballots, you know, will be available, but it's a process where you have to come in fill out the application and apply for an absentee ballot uh, to vote using that method. Percent stuck would be aided at that rate. Uh, as of March 1, we submitted our tax cap, district's tax cap at 2.32%. And we did include in finance, uh, kind of a sheet that looked at the varying levels of potential tax levy, what those would realize in current year revenue, um, what we estimated long-term impact on those to be both in terms if it was or was not levied. Any questions on the building aid rate or those tax caps? Um, Dave, you had also mentioned in finance the uh, interest rate reimbursement from the state. Didn't that change? On the yeah, building? in the area of building, uh, building. So that, that went down from 2.5 to 1.875. Now what that is, that's a state assumed interest rate. That's what they uh, assume your debt service to be. So they're coming up with a statewide interest rate of what they assume your debt's going to be and aiding you at that. Uh, of course, that tracks, you know, right along with interest. So we'd also hope that our borrowing when we buy for the current projects would be lower. But that went from 2.5 to 1.875. That's the current assumed interest rate that they'll aid us on. Thank you. So any other finance questions? Thank you, Dave, for your responsiveness with the any questions we've sent you via email. Sure, You've been very helpful. Uh, Peter, is this a good time to talk about uh, a proposed uh, uh, budget retreat for next week? I would do it later in the meeting into the finance portion so we can keep moving through the reports and we've got some guest speakers tonight so we're not tying them up. Okay, fine. Thank you. So that completes finance? Yes. Moving on to educational programs, Mr. Brewer. All right, thank you, Mr. Haggerty. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, before I begin my presentation, um, I'd like to uh, thank our, all of our teachers for and, and students for all of the work that they've been doing. Um, and, and this really constitutes what my first agenda item is. Um, I've been keeping up with our Education Week newspaper that comes uh, frequently. And not only the headlines, but almost every week they talk about a decline in reading and math scores uh, due to the pandemic and due to the hybrid and remote uh, across the nation. And I'm very proud to report um, by the hard work of our teachers and also our students during this time, we have not seen that decline that other schools are starting to see with our reading scores and math scores. Uh, there are a couple small anomalies um, along the way um, as you uh, review the data, but overall in every grade level, we did see growth. Uh, which I think is the on the positive side. Uh, this is a first year that we have used uh, the STAR literacy and the uh, STAR early literacy uh, to take a look at our reading scores within the district. So I've completed um, right now um, the data for the reading and math and just want to let the board know that that's, an, that's going to be an open ongoing um, document for you. 
Um, you, can, you can find that right from my program update. So as we move through into the spring, I will continue to use that same spreadsheet uh, so that you can make those comparisons and take a look at it. Um, I want to give you some time before I really dive deep into uh, some of that to actually take a look at that as individuals. So uh, what I'd like to offer is, is next week um, at 9.15, um, we can do it remote and also in person. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about that and also uh, offer that to any board member that would like to look a little more at the STAR program and the different types of data that we can pull for that. Um, so today, uh, just uh, for, for your reference and also for the public's reference, we're looking at uh, three pieces of data in our reading data and one right now in our math data. The one for our math data that you have um, on the spreadsheet is a percentile rank and I'll explain that in just a moment. Um, for the reading data, not only do we have the percentile rank, we also uh, looked at the IRL and the GE data. And again, I'll explain those in just a moment. Uh, but just for your reference, you will see um, as you go through the spreadsheet that the IRL and GE data are only for grades two through six. And the reason for that is because most of our, our all of our kindergarten students and most of our first graders uh, uh, worked on the early literacy test, uh, which does both math and ELA. And that early literacy is uh, for grades K through um, three, whereas the STAR literacy actually is for first through sixth. Uh, so we have some different sources of data in there uh, that I will share a little bit more in detail uh, with you on that 19th. And I also, anybody who's interested, want to talk a little bit about um, what we're doing with the reading program down the elementary all the way through uh, uh, 12. So uh, just sort of an overview, the first spreadsheet that you have, I have given you access to is a percentile rank. And the percentile ranking is a norm reference score that indicates how an individual student's performance compares to his or her same grade level peers on the national level. So when we're looking at percentile ranks, we're comparing our students with students across the country at that grade level. Our percentile rank, um, STAR sets it at the 40th percentile. Uh, we continue to keep it at that. That's a default at this moment. Um, as we continue with STAR, I'd like to put that percentile up. We can at any time, if anybody's interested in looking at it, if we move it up, uh, what those percentages are, we can always move it up and monkey with it too. Um, a percentile of rank of 40 means that a student is performing at uh, at a level that exceeds 40% of other students at the same grade, at the same time, nationwide. Hey, Chris. Uh, so basically, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Did you want to share your screen? Were you, uh, yes, you I do. Uh, just a second, yes. Just okay, want to explain that, that first. Can I do that? <laughs> yeah, I didn't know you, I didn't think you, we didn't think you realized that you weren't sharing your screen. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, I'm going to... Joe got a little bit nervous over here because he was uh, don't get pretty... nervous, Joe. I got uh, you covered. Uh, maybe that, that Chris might be slipping. <laughs> uh, I'm not slipping on you. Um, you are a co-host, so okay. I'm just having trouble. Uh, there we go. Sorry about that, folks. Um, I'm gonna share my full screen at this moment. Make sure everybody can see that. Uh, you guys are uh, smaller for me, so I can't. So the first uh, thing that you'll find when you open this up, and I'm hoping the public can see this as well, um, you're going to, uh, the, the very first, you wanna make sure you concentrate down at the bottom. Uh, those are the folders that I have for each individual school. At the beginning, you're gonna see the definition of a percentile rank in case you've forgotten what I've said tonight when you look at that. I'm just gonna, um, and uh, I, I see Ms. Middick out there. I'm not picking on Bellamy, but you're the first one. So just to show you uh, how that goes. And this is what you'll see um, as you open this up. Uh, you will take a look um, at the STAR um, math and uh, STAR early literacy. And um, I'm sorry, that should actually say down below it, uh, should say the winter instead of the fall. Uh, so I will make that correction. 
But what you will be able to see is what the percentages were above and below 40. And then down below, this is the winter uh, 2021. And then also in green, that will show you where we've seen um, increases in that proficiency level. And then also uh, the gray area is where uh, we didn't show necessarily growth at that grade level in there. Um, so just want you to be aware of that. Um, and then the next one that I'm gonna show you and bring up, I hope, is the IRL and uh, the GE. Um, the IRL is the instructional reading level. Uh, again, it's a criterion reference. Uh, I'm just gonna read this in, in case the public can't uh, see this as well. Uh, this is designed to measure student performance against a fixed set of predetermined criteria or learning standards. So the IRL puts the students up against the learning criteria rather than up against other students uh, in this uh, reading level. Score indicates the highest reading level at which a student can be effectively taught. IRLs tell you the reading level at which students can recognize words and comprehend written instructional material with some assistance. So for an example, when you see an IRL of 4.3, say for a sixth grade student, that's indicating to us that uh, the reading material that's appropriate for that student would be at the fourth grade level and three months. We also talk about a zone of proximal development. Um, and that's basically when you get to a point where the material's not quite, not quite too hard, uh, but hard enough that you'll be able to begin making some strides in your learning. Uh, that's Lev Vygotsky, uh, uh, a Russian um, psychologist who actually came up with that zone proximal development. Uh, the grade level equivalent indicates a grade placement of students for whom a particular score is typical. So for example, if a student scores a 9.6, that means they scored as well as a typical student in the six month of ninth grade. It doesn't mean, uh, don't read too far into this, it doesn't mean necessarily that student can read independently at that grade level, okay? They might be able to, but don't read too much into it that they can do that. Uh, but a grade equivalent is, is very important for us to take a look at also uh, with the students to kind of gauge where all of our students are at. Again, down on the bottom, what you will find is each individual school. Um, and what I've done is I've highlighted in yellow uh, for the grade level of, of really where we wanna begin seeing students at um, so that you have that, you also have the scores and you will see a comparison between fall and winter. Uh, just for uh, the board and the public, uh, when you see the uh, initials PP, uh, that's a pre-primer. Those are students that are still working in alphabetical principles, phonemic awareness, uh, that aren't quite reading uh, full sentences. Uh, when we get into the P, which is a primer, uh, those are students that are usually reading right around an A level on our Fontes and Pinnell scale. And if you remember that from some of our presentations in the past, you'll see a one sentence on one side of the book, and then you'll see a picture that corresponds to that. That's typically what an A-level book uh, looks like. Um, I've also uh, put in here um, the, the overall for the grade level of where everyone um, falls in that uh, region, if you, if you kind of average all those together. And then also uh, the growth that we've shown from, uh, for example, the primer for our second graders up to a 1.3. 1.3 means um, the average is reading at a uh, grade one uh, and three months at that time that the test was actually taken. Again, this is one reference point for us. If you scroll over, you will then begin to see the grade equivalency uh, for those grades. And again, I've also shown you as the group as a whole of, of where we've gone from the fall and to the winter. Again, that's, uh, if you look at this one, this is first grade in eight months. And now the grade equivalency uh, as an average for students are uh, second grade and three months. Um, so what I'd like you to do, uh, please take a look at that a little bit. I know you haven't had time, some of you haven't had time to, 
uh, really digest that. Again, next Friday, uh, we can dive a little deeper into that. And I also wanna show you some of the other data that we can draw out of our STAR program. And then also talk a little bit about um, our reading program where we're at at the elementary and secondary and, and where we were foresee and what we're working on moving forward. Um, any questions on that one? Before I- Chris, uh, is the Friday session gonna be at a particular time? Uh, yes, we're going to start around 9.15. So we, will you be sending a, an address out virtual? Absolutely. I'll send a virtual. I, I know a few people indicated that they would be interested in uh, coming in person to the boardroom, and we'd be able to um, accommodate that also. I'm trying Good. to give me just one second. I'm sorry, guys. I'm trying to. There we go. Stop presenting. And for some reason, that's not showing up for me. OK. You're not presenting, Chris. I'm not. OK, thank you. Sorry about that. I'm sorry for the delay, everyone. Uh, my next um, agenda item um, that I'd like to uh, give you a little bit of update on is um, some trauma training that we've been working on. Um, I want to thank Amanda Jones for her hard work of putting this together for our admin team, both at the district level and also in the building. So this past week, our administration uh, went to trauma training um, remote. Our admins learned um, how to better understand the dynamics of trauma and also how trauma impacts not only ourselves, but the children that we're working with, especially during this time period. They discussed how the current collective trauma we are all experiencing through this pandemic might manifest itself in new and challenging behaviors that we may not have seen uh, pre-COVID uh, with some of our students uh, and, and some of uh, the, um, and also sometimes within ourselves, some things that are happening too. Participants learn specifically about adverse childhood experiences. That's also known as the acronym ACEs. You may be familiar with that. And also how ACEs contribute to long-term negative outcomes for individuals. It was presented by Carrie Conti and Jeremy Butler from ICANN, which was formerly Kids Oneida. I really want to reach out. I know they're not with us tonight, but really thank them for their presentation to the admin staff. And um, again, to Amanda Jones for her hard work on this. Um, Amanda is now still gathering some uh, uh, feedback from our administrators based on that pre uh, presentation uh, and then looking to how we can unroll this and work with our staff within the schools. Um, I did on the administrative update, put a link for you to the ICANN program if you're interested in a little bit more information about uh, what they do. Again, that was formerly Kids Oneida. The third thing is the AP test update. I know that's been a topic for our last two meetings. So just wanted to give the board and uh, Jordan, I'm hoping Jordan's on here tonight, uh, just a little bit of update and everyone in the public too. Um, Chris, Jordan's not here tonight. It's her last senior volleyball game. All right. Well, congratulations, Jordan. Um, I spoke with guide, uh, the guidance department, or actually Shelly Skivitsky from guidance and also Emily Dodd, assistant principal. Um, currently, what we are doing, Shelly Skivitsky is going to compile a video with information about both the computerized test version and also paper test for teachers, students, and parents. Uh, there will be a link upcoming for parents. We did do a survey of students. We had 305 students respond to that survey. Right now, as it stands, 68.5 are wanting to take it on the computer at home. 25.6 are interested in taking it in, in a person on paper. And 5.9% of our students would like to actually take it on the computer in school. Um, after the... Um, um, after this, students and parents are gonna be asked, once that information goes out to them, we're gonna ask parents and uh, students to really take a look at that. Think about what um, is presented in that video about the choices and what that looks like. Um, and then students and parents will be asked to solidify their preferences by March 29th. Online students will take the first administration of the computer test 
Again, if you look at the highlighted blue, I sent you right to the AP uh, board, uh, their website for those tests. There's three testing sessions. We're looking at the first and the second administration for most students. Uh, with the exception of calculus, physics, and chemistry, uh, students that want to take that online, those are only offered in the third administration of the test, which is in late June. So for students wanting to take the other test, that's going to be um, in person in May. And then following that will be the administration um, by computer. So I, I would imagine after that information, we're going to have some number changes. And I'll keep you up to date after March 29th what that looks like. Any questions with that, AP? Okay, and um, I will update you um, on the next thing, which is our uh, taking a look at our elementary science and social studies uh, curriculum and programming that we use. Um, currently, and we've been using this uh, for about four, three to four years now, uh, when, when Jim D'Angelo was here, uh, we're utilizing the Buzz Learning Management Platform uh, that is through OHM BOCES. Uh, this provides activities and materials to meet the state standards in both science and social studies. However, recently after talking to uh, not only our TCs, but some other teachers, um, and also talking to the elementary principals, uh, we feel the need to take a look at something a little bit different for our students, especially in the areas of science. Um, there's been some uh, frustration expressed, especially during remote learning. Uh, with Buzz and how it interacts with Google Classroom. Uh, we can certainly understand that uh, from the teacher perspective too. And they also have indicated that some of the materials are not fully meeting the needs of students, especially in the sciences, uh, because those state standards have changed um, in, in what's expected of a student now in science, both at the elementary and secondary level is also changing. Uh, so uh, we sought out a couple new resources that will help teachers to meet the needs of our students. Uh, I met with three of the principals um, in Dana about two weeks ago uh, to take a look at the program called Amplify. Um, Amplify, what's uh, very interesting about Amplify and, and, and why we think this might be a good option before looking at more, it provides a wealth of resources both online and also in hard copy uh, to help students understand what's called the three dimensions of science. Um, that's really the change in the NGLS is those three dimensions, as well as the phenomenon of based approach to teaching science also. Um, what they do is they create their units based on a phenomenon and the standards are taught to students based around the entire phenomenon. For example, one of the phenomena that they have, I believe it's third graders uh, work on, is third graders are presented with a phenomenon of a uh, train, a, a magnetic train that actually floats on air. And the whole magnetism unit is based around that inquiry of uh, them having to present to the city of how and why that is a, a, a appropriate way to bring that type of technology into their city. So everything they learn about is tied back to that phenomenon um, that they have to explain through different uh, means. The other thing with the program is we also buy into science kits from OHM BOCES on that service. The program actually comes with their own science kits to go along with the phenomenon and replacement parts for the science kits are very easy to be able to replace uh, through it orders at Staples or um, sometimes even the dollar store. Uh, that can be a cost savings um, to the district as well. Um, also in the program, something that we're looking at uh, very closely that's, that's really important to um, uh, the principals and, and the teachers is also how are we incorporating disciplinary literacy um, in the sciences and how are we also including more literacy time without just not focusing on nonfiction and fiction texts that we do in ELA. Amplify also seems to fit, fit the bill here because they also have a series of nonfiction texts that go along with the kits that they send to the teachers. Um, at our lower grades, they have those big books and at the smaller grades, they have the smaller uh, picture books for students. 
Also within this, another question that we asked, uh, because as we start looking at new pro programs in curriculum, we also have to make sure that these programs and curricular, uh, curriculum uh, uh, resources are culturally responsive to all of our students' needs. Um, Amplify meets that standard. Um, they have books about different scientists and all of these scientists are, they're just not, uh, they're from different cultural backgrounds. So students are able to see themselves also as scientists as they perform some of these things in the classroom. It also has a great ENL support and program and the program itself, if we were to ever have to go hybrid or online again, uh, where we had to uh, close the school. Hopefully we never have to do that again. Um, but uh, it allows them and it, it syncs very well with Google Classroom. Our next step in this process, um, the principals um, gave their thumbs up to continue to go ahead with this um, and take a look further. We have invited four teachers from each grade level, K through six to be a part of uh, talking with Amplify and taking a look at this Amplify program on March 23rd. We've also invited uh, two middle school science teachers and also two high school science teachers because we also want to make sure that these resources are going to be in line with what's going to be expected when they come up to middle, uh, middle uh, school science and also that it's going to hit on things that they need for um, high school science. Last, we are also receiving some samples for each uh, grade level uh, for teachers to explore. And I apologize, I just noticed that I did not link uh, two of them in here and I'll do that in a little while. Uh, for social studies, we're looking at uh, Savas, which is formerly uh, Prentice Hall uh, Pearson Learning. Uh, Prentice Hall is no longer there. Savas has bought them out. Prentice Hall has long been the standard uh, for social studies text and resources in New York State. Uh, so we want to look at Savas a little bit closer uh, since they're a new company, uh, but they seem to be a little bit um, in line with that. We're also looking for something that is uh, fairly similar to uh, meeting the needs that uh, Amplify seems to be meeting for our social studies. So we're looking at those literacy pieces. Um, is there lit literacy that they can, uh, that teachers can use? Um, to uh, do shared reading or um, to, to read with the kids in class. That's something besides the textbook. We're also looking at, do they have an online program that syncs well with Google Classroom, if ever needed to be able to use that. And um, we will be, oh, I'm sorry, I did. I, I just didn't scroll down far enough. Uh, there's also a link in there for the Savas materials for you to take a look at. Houghton Mifflin is another company that we're looking at for possible resources and also uh, McGraw-Hill. Uh, what we will do is we'll have them do some presentations to our elementary principals. Um, and then we will do that same procedure working with uh, teachers at the grade level and, um, and also our middle and high school uh, uh, teachers as well to make sure that there's some strong alignment um, within those um, resources. And uh, that's my report for the evening. I'd be happy to take any other questions that you might have. Yeah, I just have a quick question for you, Chris. Nothing related to what you talked about tonight. Um, is there a requirement or a, a, a minimum number that uh, secondary students, especially at the high school, how many classes they have to take for a year? Is there a requirement? Is um, I don't, there's, I don't I believe there's a specific a requirement for the number of courses that they have to take uh, in a year. Um, that would be looked at, obviously. I mean, there's different scenarios with that, depending on what year the student is at and depending whether or not a student needs to make up credits, uh, whether a student's going to BOCES or Propel, uh, that would determine the number of uh, classes or hours that a student would be taking uh, periods they'd be taking at the high school. So it'd be very individualized by the student. Okay, so there's no minimum then? Well, uh, students have to earn 22 credits in order to graduate, if, if that's the question. There's no state mandated minimum per year. Uh, you can have a local policy that mandates that you must take five and a half academic credits within a given year. So you can't, you know, load up on, uh, you can't, 
just load up on study halls or have, you know, if you get old mm -hmm. to a certain point, do the early dismissal, late arrival type thing. But we don't have anything in place that, that sets a, a minimum threshold for credits. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I thought those kids were getting scheduled for five minimum. The, most kids are scheduled for six and a half credits per year or per year within a given calendar year, but there's no there's no policy on the books mm -hmm. that the district has. It's a minimum standard and there's no minimum standard set by state education department. So a student feasibly could just by their senior year have their BOCES requirement to fulfill. They could. And just Correct. a Correct. Because I had heard something similar and heard that essentially the thought that it was understood that it had to be the five and that students were getting scheduled for an extra course, be it an economics and government, which they technically don't need because they get at BOCES or a senior English and then not showing up. So it's impacting attendance because there's an yeah. impression it somewhere could. that they need to be scheduled for five. So I guess if that is said somewhere, we have to clarify. So we have to get rid of that. So is it possible that, that it could, would be like college almost, that you could load up and do all your classes early and only have one or two classes? You, you can student? graduate high school early, yes. Okay. That confuses me. Does that mean we're not challenging kids enough? I'm, I guess I'm, I don't know. Well, the, the thing you have to remember about a current high school situation right now is more so than ever, you've got teenagers that are, that are trying to juggle at a lot more advanced college classes than they ever had before. You, you know, you got juniors and seniors that are taking all advanced classes. Most of them are trying to get their first jobs and work jobs, part-time jobs throughout the course of their high school uh, year. And they're involved in probably an extracurricular activity, a lot of kids as well. Uh, and even if it's not a school activity, you still have a lot of kids in high school that participate in youth things like uh, karate or summer camps or local camps or YMCA. And so not every extracurricular activity is school related. So I would say that you want to be careful how much you're trying to push your kids. It's a, there's a fine balance. That's where you really rely on your counselors to make sure that, you know, that you got a good eye on where the kids are. And if they, if you got kids that are trying to excel, that that might be a little bit too much for them that you, you have those good conversations with the families and the kids. I think that leans there's into a fine balance. Karen and I have had some conversations about, I, I know it's part of the RTA's contract that they have an, an ed policy committee. And there's been some conversation about us, making sure that what's in our main policy manual and what's in ad policy. I know when we talked about the grading policy, we want things like that to be consistent. We don't want things written on our side that aren't consistent with what's actually happening or that's in another document somewhere. So maybe that would be an additional one that just, um, I think, it, you know, Karen and I have said it, it might be just a good opportunity for us at one point to have that be a joint meeting maybe and sit down with the ed, the ed policy, the teachers that are on the ed policy with ours and um, be clear. You know, that's been our goal as a policy committee even prior to my coming on that we can write anything we want, but we don't want to write something that doesn't make sense for how we actually instruct our kids. Yeah. Do we have any more questions for Chris? If not, uh, thank you, Chris. I, want, I, sorry, I have one more. Chris, how soon those new programs that you're talking about sound great? Um, but obviously everyone's feeling stretched and overwhelmed right now. When, what is your timeline for implementation on those things? Right now I'm, I'm looking at, for science for sure. Um, we really need to get that implemented um, um, next year if we're gonna do that. Um, same thing with social studies, we've gotta take a look at that. Uh, one thing to understand, social studies and science has to be taught. We're looking at resources to provide to teachers to be able to teach those areas. Um, and and uh, at the elementary level, we, we don't have folks that are content specialists like at the high school. So if, if someone's not necessarily, uh, you know, didn't take a lot of science courses, what we're looking for with these resources is they're also going to be able to help the teacher as they talk about some of those processes and as they have kids work through those processes. That's one of the things that, Buzz, that, that uh, we're hearing with Buzz is not working well, but teachers are mandated at the elementary live level to teach both social studies and science. So it's, it's a matter of what resources do we want to use to be able to teach those state standards to make it helpful for uh, teachers to be able to do the critical thinking that's necessary there. And also materials that are gonna work for ours, that are gonna be in line with the NGSS and the new social studies standards 
and that will also help our students to achieve at those levels. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you, Chris. That completes welcome, our. Everyone. Uh, Thank you. That completes our de departmental reports. We'll move forward. Uh, approve the minutes of the regular meeting of February twenty fifth. Uh, do I hear a motion? Motion. Motion and second. Second. Motion and second. Any comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Paul, could I interrupt for a minute to remind any members of the public that if they're interested in making public comment, that will be after the superintendent's report. And if they could please submit their name and email in the Q&A, we'll make note uh, that they're interested in speaking. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you uh, which, uh, okay, so we have approved the, uh, the minutes. Uh, any additions or deletions to the agenda? There are none tonight. Very good. So we're on to uh, your report, Mr. Blake. Good evening. Thank you, sir. Welcome, everybody. Uh, four quick things for you tonight. First of all, congratulations to the RFA class of 2021 top 10 that was announced uh, yesterday, I believe, or the day before. So we have uh, some good stuff moving forward, and we are certainly getting closer to the end. So I know there's still a lot of questions out there about what the end of the year looks like and commencement and all of those things. Uh, as of today, we are planning for a full commencement. Um, I'm anticipating that things will relax enough by then that we will be able to do that for our students. Uh, so let's all keep on that train and, uh, and keep our fingers crossed by, by June that we will be there. Uh, second thing I wanna update on, I had an opportunity yesterday to uh, spend some time meeting with Senator Mayer, who is the State Senate Education Committee Chair uh, there was about eight of us superintendents from the region that were invited to a meeting with her uh, to really talk about all things government related as it relates to education. Uh, the big things that she mentioned, the big three takeaways, uh, usually when you get to meet with some folks, you end up uh, kind of hearing the same things over and over again. We know foundation aid really isn't gonna make, uh, be changed anytime soon, but we continue to lobby for that. But the big ones that I took away from the meeting yesterday uh, with the Senator was that she did tell us that the uh, state health department and the state education department have no intention of revising their August 2020 school reopening guidance documents. Uh, and that we should not expect any changes or relief from either the state health department or the state education department from the guidance that was set in place in August of 2020. So that was not met with uh, a whole lot of pleasure from the superintendents because we all know a lot has changed since August of 2020, but uh, on the positive side, at least we've been given uh, information that it's not going to change. So stop sitting back and hoping that the state level is gonna make its change. Uh, we now need to continue to focus locally as best we can. Uh, the other thing that uh, she said that was of importance was that as of right now, there is still no information or guidance or thoughts about the fall of 2021. Uh, that continues to be concerning and alarming for uh, all leaders because we uh, continue to reiterate to people that we are trying to plan budgets now for next year. And if we know what to plan for, our budgets can be more sensible. Uh, we can put our resources in the right place and we can make sure that next year, September reopening schools is a lot more uh, seamless and sensible than it was last year. So people are hearing our voices uh, unfortunately, those that make the decisions are, are not yet doing that. The last thing that I'll point out from the meeting actually did not come from Senator Mayer's office, but from Senator Griffo's office. Senator Griffo is a fantastic partner for education, a uh, fantastic partner for the Rome City School District. He's always one of the most honest and straightforward people that I ever have a chance to talk to. If it's not good, he has no problem telling you that things are not good. And generally speaking, he uh, does not deliver great news coming out of Albany about anything related to school budget or state budget. Uh, however, he did say that he believes that the conversations that people are having about school funding from the last stimulus package that was passed today, uh, he believes that the information that you're hearing is probably under uh, underserving what really is going to come. And that's uh, coming from Senator Griffo, that's a big statement. Uh, he doesn't usually say that things coming out publicly are probably going to actually be better than what you're hearing. 
Uh, and I can say that I can uh, triangulate that statement a little bit in that in a conversation with a representative from Senator Schumer's office, uh, their word was that the amount of funding coming to the Roman City School District should be substantial. Uh, we don't have figures on that. Figures are not available to public schools yet from that uh, last stimulus package, but we do have uh, two separate government agencies uh, suggesting that the funding coming in the last round should be uh, helpful. So what will remain to be seen with that is if the funding comes directly from the federal government to the school district, or if it gets funneled through the state. Uh, and if it does get funneled through the state, we have to hope that the governor uh, does not take away further state funding as he did with the first two stimulus packages. So there's still some tricky areas that we have to maneuver with that, but uh, good news on the horizon relative to the last federal uh, stimulus package. Next thing I wanna mention real quickly, I also had an opportunity, uh, the county superintendents had an opportunity to meet with the county executive and his team on Monday, late Monday afternoon. Uh, he did inform us that the county is working on what they call strategies for reopening schools safely. Uh, I do not believe as of today, they've publicly released that document yet, but when they do, uh, I was hopeful it would be done by tonight so the Board of Education and I could discuss in public uh, what those strategies are and how we're going to make them fit for Rome. Uh, but alas, they did not. So we will have that conversation as soon as we can. Uh, we are committed to getting kids in five days a week. It does seem like all agencies are leaning towards plastic barriers being the solution to the problem uh, and, and basically outfitting your schools with a ton of plastic uh, what I've said all along um, is that I don't believe that's a wise investment of funding. Um, if we need to do this for next year, then that might be a different story. But if it's a Band-Aid to help us get from the middle of April to the end of June, uh, spending roughly $500,000, a half a million dollars on plastic that's going to go in a storage shed in two years uh, when we could use social workers, counselors, support staff, uh, teachers, I, I think our money would be better invested in the students' education uh, than the plastic barriers, and that's that's a personal opinion, and, and we can have that debate with the board at the time when we know which direction we're going to have to go, whether we're going to be allowed to go within six feet or if we're going to need those barriers. But uh, even if we were to order them today, we're not so certain we can get the amount of barriers we need in Rome uh, before the beginning of June, uh, the beginning of May, we're not certain. We are investigating that. We've got cost points. Uh, now we got to figure out shipping costs. So unfortunately, the county has not released that information. Uh, so we can't really have an open discussion about it. But there are guidelines coming from the county strategies. I apologize, strategies uh, coming from the county, um, what they feel we can do to get more kids in school safely. Um, and we will do everything we can to make sure that that happens. The last thing I want to report on briefly, and then I'll also let uh, Ms. Davis or Dr. Fontana make a comment if they want. Last night, uh, the Board of Education hosted a uh, fantastic parent forum uh, that I took part in as uh, more of a moderator or a, uh, uh, I guess, a facilitator of technology would be the right <laughs> word. Uh, but it was good to see the dialogue. Uh, we used uh, several live thought exchanges that uh, yielded quite a, a lot of thoughts, ideas, um, kind of good dialogue and some breakout groups, some good question and answer amongst the whole group towards the end of it. Uh, we all felt from the three of us that were here at the board office pretty positive about the meeting. Uh, the parents seem to feel pretty positive about it and we uh, are looking forward to doing more things like this in the future. I will be getting with our PR department tomorrow and we will be doing a story about the thought exchanges so the entire community can see uh, the questions that were asked, the responses to those questions, and how the group of people involved uh, rated those questions. So uh, pretty fruitful conversations, good starting point, and look forward to continuing that work. And that's all I have. I will uh, welcome any questions and or comments about last night to anybody that was there, if they would like. Well, I'm glad you, you um, mentioned you're going to put this off. I was wondering how the rest of the public would understand, you know, find out what questions and issues were. Yes. Very good. Um, I, I would just like to say I am very appreciative. Karen put together an outstanding framework. Um, Peter did make all of the technology work in terms of our breakout rooms um, and the thought exchange process. Um, Karen and I shared some thoughts today and are kind of consolidating some of the thoughts. Um, 
and we sent a follow-up thank you email. I hope that everyone got that, but I really have to say thank you. I mean, we know how much time parents are investing right now in helping their kids through their education. And we had 25 parents get on and spend almost two hours with us having a really good dialogue. Um, I would have to say that for the most part, um, they were definitely things, I, I don't think anything came and hit us out of left field. Would you say, Peter? I think they were things that we anticipated were the primary concerns. Um, and I want to say that the number one thing that came out is how appreciative parents really are of teachers, no matter how frustrated they feel. Um, it is not um, unnoticed to families how dedicated our educators are and how much they're, they're giving and how exhausted they must be and um, how much they're trying to make this process easier. So um, I look forward to us sharing that. And our goal moving forward is to have some additional sessions with the same um, set of questions. Um, so as Karen and I chatted today as a follow-up, our goals would be to have a panel of uh, families specifically from the supported learning area, um, a panel of students, and we were thinking perhaps not just high school students, but maybe six through 12, um, the teachers themselves, and then the administration. And it's um, it'll be very interesting as we go through the various areas to see um, does everything line up with where our families are or are we kind of all over the board and how do we move ourselves to being on the same page? So is there anything else, Karen? I, I, I again, we're very grateful and um, appreciative to, um, to Peter for helping us, to Mr. Blake for helping us to uh, make this all work and hopefully, and again, we also advise those parents, we will continue to engage you. We don't believe that this is simply a, um, COVID task force. This is really driven towards how we improve instructional outcomes now and in the future. And we really need to give our parents and families that opportunity to have a forum to express their concerns. Well, as a passive par participant, I, I, I'd like to congratulate the three of you uh, for a first time out. It went amazingly well and the, and the technology worked well. Very, very interesting process, I think, for all. Um, so that completes your report, Mr. Blake? Yes, sir. Okay, then we're on to our work study session, which is uh, huh? our, uh, a presentation on the energy performance contractor. Are you going to introduce that, Mr. Blake? I think we have a public comment first. Oh, I'm excuse, excuse me. Um, I'm not reading my agenda correctly. Yes, we do have public comment. And I think we have at least uh, one person out there. Is that right, Tanya? Yeah, give me just a moment. Um, okay, before we entertain public comment, as always, we wanna remind everyone, if um, this is an opportunity to appear before the school board and express your views concerning agenda items and district affairs. We ask that you limit your remarks to five minutes. All public speakers are asked to refrain from making personal attacks towards district employees and elected officials. Be advised that your comments do not enjoy the same privilege and immunity as statements made by members of the Board of Education and that defamatory or obscene statements are prohibited. Please note that unless specifically indicated on the agenda, this time is not a question and answer period. There is no exchange of conversation with the members of the board or executive staff. However, if your comments require a response, every effort will be made to get back to you within a reasonable time frame. So I know I do have one person out there who has um, indicated that um, they, potentially wanted to speak. Um, so Dr. Hampy, we'll go ahead and add you. And in the meantime, um, Ms. Van Hoosel, if you wanted to, if you have a specific question, you can email it to us at asktheboe at romecsd.org and uh, copy Mr. Blake and we can get back to you or you can present your question here. It may be something we can answer tonight or it may be something that we do need to take time to get back to you. Dr. Hampy, you are in the room. Thank you, sir. Um, first, I'd like to say that uh, my initial question, because I know it is of uh, great concern to many in the community, is what might be coming to the district from the Rescue Act. And I am appreciative, Mr. Blake, that you did indicate that there's still some um, ambiguity as to what might actually show up but I would ask for some clarification as to what you meant by no change in the August 2020 standards as that would play out in the funding. Um, second item, 
during Mr. Dreidel's presentation about the possibility of changing voting districts or voting locations, there was some uh, advocacy for maintaining a city hall uh, location because of the seniors involved. I would like to remind the board that if you move from Gansevoort, which has long been considered uh, the district's last walking school, you would potentially be disenfranchising a significant number of parents. So I appreciate this is a difficult decision, but if you are going to consolidate uh, locations, it is likely that one large population is going to be disenfranchised, and I had hoped that that would be considered. Lastly, I think it is important to reiterate that it seems a little peculiar that a well-regarded thought exchange event occurred, which would suggest a opening to more parental public community engagement I do not recall that being widely advertised, yet the board has chosen to close down the chat and screen the questions or, or request or demand um, advanced notification of public comment via the chat, even though when first moving to Zoom, there were some members who would take questions from anybody where they, uh, however they arose. Bottom line, if there's going to be a stated policy or a stated procedure for submitting public comment, it should be widely publicized. And I'm looking right at the agenda, which makes no reference to that. It would seem to be in the best interest of everyone involved if those requirements were explicitly stated in policy and reiterated on the agenda. Thank you very much. Um, Mrs. Van Ozel is going to submit her question via email. Thank you. That should be it, Patty. Okay, that concludes the uh, public comment. Uh, we'll move on to the work study session uh, and the aforementioned uh, energy performance contract. Back to you, Mr. Blake. Yes, thank you, sir. Good evening, everybody. We have, a, we have with us tonight, Stephen Abramsky and Robert Whiteman from CNS companies who are uh, operating our energy performance contract. We finished the first round uh, in the fall, uh, summer fall, and now we are getting set to start round two. So we talked about this a little bit analysis update two weeks ago. Uh, just wanted to invite the two gentlemen to give the board and community a brief overview or really refresher of what it is that the EPC2 entails that we hope to get started uh, sometime here in the late spring, early summer. So I'll turn it over to uh, Stephen, I think it looks like you're unmuted, so I'm guessing you're talking first, huh? Yes, sir. Took me a year, but I figured out some Zoom etiquette. <laughs> the floor is yours. All right, well, thank you, Mr. Blake. So uh, as Mr. Blake said, we recently uh, received approval for the phase two project of the energy performance contract. Uh, so I thought it'd be a good opportunity to kind of give everybody a little refresher on the scope of work and a little bit of insight onto the implementation plan. So the first part of this uh, contract, the biggest component of it is an LED lighting upgrade. Uh, those, those of you who remember, or those of you who've had the opportunity to take a walk through um, RFA recently, you'll see uh, brand new LED lighting with a advanced lighting control system. We're gonna be mimicking the same system throughout all of the elementary buildings, um, Bellamy, Bath, Denti, Gansevoort, Joy, Ridge Mills, and Stokes, and then district-wide exterior lighting. And the intention is to have, um, to, to bring all of the disparate schools lighting systems into a single head end, uh, similar to your building control system, so that you can, from a single point of contact, control all of the lighting in the district. And so that the end users in each space will have control over dimming levels uh, and scene so that they can customize the teaching space. The next component of the project is going to be uh, building envelope uh, improvements. We did a um, survey of all of the buildings in the district and identified a considerable amount of air leakage uh, around windows, uh, worn out weather stripping around doors and uh, air infiltration through the roof wall connections. These are, this is frequently a weak point on most building construction. So this is not a surprise, this is not a, this is not an issue unique to uh, the Rome City School District. Uh, it's simply a, a, a weak point for all construction. 
Uh, additionally, we identified that uh, around the vertical unit ventilators in classroom spaces, uh, there is improper sealing around the duct connection with the outdoor louvers, and that's actually leading to cold air infiltration inside of the plenums, which is cooling the duct work so that the air being discharged into the classrooms is cooler than it would otherwise be. So we're gonna work to uh, seal all of these uh, points of air infiltration uh, using caulk, um, fire-rated foam boards, uh, spray foam insulations in order to isolate the building system so that we don't have this cold air infiltration. Uh, we did this at RFA in the first phase of the EPC, and in the second phase of the EPC, this scope of work will be extended to all of the other facilities in the district. Thirdly, we're continuing the district's building controls upgrade. Uh, as first part of the project, we converted the Rome uh, Free Academy over to a Niagara 4 building control system. And we are going to be migrating the rest of the district over to that system as well, so that there's a single point of access for all of the building controls. And it will all be a modern uh, Niagara Force system, so that there's uniform graphics across all of the equipment. Additionally, as part of this scope of work, we're going to be addressing some control issues with uh, vertical unit ventilators at four of the elementary schools. Uh, four of these schools have two pipe heating systems. So you use the same piping for heating in the winter and cooling in the summer. And there's an issue where during the shoulder month where it's cool in the morning, but hot in the afternoon, there's overheating issues in some classrooms. So we're adding a heat purge mode to the controls on these particular units in order to purge the heat out of, the, uh, out of these classrooms so that, um, so that we reduce or completely eliminate the overheating issues that some of these kids are experiencing. Thirdly, uh, we're moving to the, uh, the both mechanical components of the district. Uh, at four of the buildings, the hydronic piping is what's called grooved and fitting. So instead of being welded together, uh, there's actually the, the pipe is butted together and there's basically clamps that connect the different sections of piping. This is a very common practice uh, for hydronic systems and it's a very good system. But for some reason, uh, four of your facilities had premature pipe, uh, premature failure at some of these couplings. So last year, myself and another a couple of other engineers came down and we did a, a failure mode analysis on all of these points of failure, identified some uh, system corrections that we could implement to A, uh, get rid of the leaks and B, uh, prevent the leaks from reforming in the future. So this includes uh, increased hangar supports and we redesigned a couple of the expansion loops in order to give more expansion potential for, um, for the heat, for when the, the system heat cycles. Um, while we're doing this work, we're gonna have to be draining the system. So we're also taking the opportunity to add some low point and high point, um, low point drains and high point vents on the system. So that's easier, easier to purge the system and adding isolation valves to the um, to the chillers at these facilities so that the chillers can be isolated and drained properly. Moving on from there, uh, we are doing a boiler replacement at cloth at the pre-K. These, uh, this building currently has two very old cast iron boilers. Uh, they're, they are well beyond what would normally be considered their serviceable lifespan. So we're gonna be replacing these with two uh, new high efficiency condensing boilers in order to extend the lifespan of that facility's uh, heating plant. We did, we did a similar scope of work out at RFA in the previous phase. So we're gonna, going to be using uh, the same type of equipment so that you can start standardizing on, um, on mechanical equipment. Lastly, we're going to be installing a new booster heater at Denti. Currently the booster heater there uh, draws a significant electrical demand, which after the LED lighting is going to represent a dramatic percentage of the overall district's electrical demand. So in the interest of continued load shedding, we're going to be converting that to a natural gas, a high efficiency natural gas fired booster heater uh, in place of the 54 kW uh, electric heater, which like I said, we're at, I think it's $8 a kW times 54 kW a month. Uh, the 
the um, savings is pretty dramatic at several thousand dollars a year for the district. That, that demand shedding is very, very important in terms of uh, increasing or decreasing overall facility operating costs. All in all, the scope of work is projected to, uh, to save about $193,000 in energy um, consumption per year with an additional $18,000 per year in reduced material maintenance costs. This is in terms of um, reduced glycol needed to top off the system from the leaks. This includes um, not needing to buy replacement um, fluorescent bulbs for lighting because they'll be converted to LED, dedicated LED fixtures. And it is the reduction of the need to replace ballasts because they, these new fixtures do not have ballasts that have lifetime drivers in them. The scope of work is intended to uh, kick off, as Peter said, uh, late spring, early summer. Uh, the first thing to kick off is going to be the building envelope work. We're currently putting together a, a safety plan right now in order to perform the work second shift. We will perform, we will submit the safety plan to the district. If the district approves the plan, we will be able to perform the work second shift. If the district decides no, this isn't this isn't something we want to start until summer, then we hold off until summer. We want to give the district that flexibility. Uh, boiler work at Cloth will be beginning um, end of May. We intend to begin end of May. Uh, that's um, that's work that doesn't require access in student spaces, so we just need to have time. We just need that the boiler plant to be shut off for the season in order to start that work. The rest of the work we intend to start um, end of June after students are no longer occupying the um, occupying the facilities, so that we can work uninterrupted and not have to worry about interfering with uh, regular instruction. And then the the district should begin um, receiving the benefit from the cost savings in um, uh, early fall of 2021. So that's a brief update of uh, the scope of work of the project and where we currently stand. Uh, does anybody have any questions about uh, scope of work or implementation? I have a couple, uh, uh, Steve. Uh, the uh, the booster heater at Denny, that's to supply the hot water to the to the building? Uh, that is to supply uh, sanitizing hot water to the dishwasher. So the, the existing domestic hot water produces uh, 120 degree hot water and New York State requires 180 degree hot water as a for to sanitize um, dishes. So the booster heater is in line with the hot water piping going to the dishwasher to get that additional temperature rise so that you meet um, New York State requirements for the sanitization temperatures uh, for that dishwasher so that you're not running um, water through your normal domestic hot water system that would scald students. Uh, my other question is, um, it didn't sound like you mentioned any work at RFA uh, when you went through your, your list of uh, projects, is that correct? So there will be piping corrections at RFA. Uh, RFA was unfortunately one of the buildings that was affected by, um, by the grooved end fitting failures. So we will be performing piping corrections there. Uh, that includes replacing failed couplings and re, um, we're going to remove some of the expansion joints and install new redesigned expansion joints to give, to give the system more flexibility. That is, however, the only scope of work that's going to occur at RFA. Uh, everything else um, that we felt would be advantageous to the district was addressed in the EPC1 project. Thank you. Very good. Um, I, have, I have two quick questions. So one, I, I had to sit here, and I'm sure that Patty saw me counting on my fingers the years. I, I can't believe it's been eight years since we renovated Denti. So my son was in third grade, and he is now a junior. But uh, is that, I mean, eight years is still not that old for an HVAC system. It, was that done at that time, or is this something that we're upgrading that was older than that? Uh, the the boilers are significantly, or I'm sorry, not the boiler, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of the wrong building. Um, so this isn't a renovation, it's simply kind of just an upgrade codes change. So it's really a modernization of what's there. Uh, Denti the isn't going to be seeing um, new HVAC equipment being installed. Oh, that's, not, that, that's not my question. My question is, if the equipment was new eight years ago and we invested a lot of money in a capital project to do it, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. did we not use the most efficient project and are we replacing something now that we never even got our useful life out of and how do we avoid doing that again in the future uh you are not you are not replacing anything that you did not get useful life out of uh we're not physically replacing that equipment uh we're simply changing how that equipment is being controlled okay in, in order in order to try to use it more efficiently okay and my other question is not specifically related to this, but I know it's a pressing question for most of us. Um, when we talk about building envelopes and um, HVAC is the question of um, what we don't know yet about what federal and state guidelines are going to be for ventilation. Mm -hmm. So um, has that been a conversation on your side of the table yet? And is it something that um, districts are gonna have to start planning for to make our buildings healthier? Mm -hmm. So uh, current, the current project, the ventilation rates are designed to the uh, inter international mechanical codes. Uh, those have not been updated for, um, for COVID, but the system that you have has the flexibility to make any uh, ventilation changes that may be required. You have excess capacity in the system and it's simple, it, you don't need to physically replace hardware in order to modify uh, the ventilation requirements to these spaces. So you, ha you have the capacity um, with your current infrastructure to make ventilation changes uh, if the state makes any recommendations in that regard. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions? I have a follow up for you, Steve, kind of along the lines of that last answer. Um, I know in, in, in talking to Alex Rodriguez in, in an earlier session, we were talking about the desirability of um, essentially increasing the ventilation in the various rooms that were serviced by the uh, unit ventilators, since mm -hmm. those are sort of like little self-contained environments, and and you could uh, you could improve the uh, ventilation by, and and he said that uh, there were some steps that had been taken. I mean, he mentioned uh, improved filters, and I think uh, to trying to uh, circulate the air as much as they could. At the time, he was concerned a little bit about the winter uh, situations in terms of freezing things up if they circulated too much cold air and brought too much fresh cold air in. But can you comment on that at all, or were you involved in that? So I was not involved in that, but okay. uh, as as Alex said, you can increase the outdoor air ventilation rate to increase the number of air exchanges per hour, so that you're so that you're not breathing the same air quite as long. Um, most of your classrooms are served by vertical unit ventilators that have heat exchangers inside of them that use the exhaust air to preheat the incoming air. So you have a little bit of extra, extra capacity in terms of being able to bring in outdoor ventilation air. Yeah, thank you. Do we have anything else for energy performance contracting? If not, we thank you for uh, making the presentation. It was quite uh, comprehensive and lots of work in our in our elementary building. So and kicking off very soon. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Haggerty. Gentlemen, appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, moving on in our agenda, we have a. a a commendation, uh, would anybody like to read that? If not, I will. I can do um, it. Okay. Am I in? Okay. You're good. <clears throat> Resolution for commendation. Whereas the members of the Rome Free Academy girls bowling team coached by Brian Rondeau and boys varsity swimming and diving team coached by Michelle Moore Brown have demonstrated a high standard of excellence receiving from the New York State Public High School Athletic Association, a Scholar Athlete Team Award by achieving a winter marking period average of 90 or higher. And whereas the members of the Rome Free Academy girls bowling team and boys varsity swimming and diving team have brought credit to themselves, their teachers, their families, their coaches, and in turn to the Rome City School District, 
Now, therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools do hereby extend their congratulations to the members of the Rome Free Academy Girls Varsity Bowling Team and Boys Varsity Swimming and Diving Team for such outstanding academic achievement. And be it further resolved that the Clerk of the Board of Education be and is hereby directed to spread this resolution on the minutes of tonight's meeting. I move the resolution. Second. Move and seconded by Mr. Malachi. Malachi. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. Very good. Congratulations. All I can't wait till we can congratulate those kids in person again. Yeah. <laughs> and this is uh, multiple years that they've done that, right? I, mean, I, I seem to recall That's... last year. Yes. Yes. This is frequent. And for those people just kind of wondering why it's just these two sports, the rest of the winter sports are still wrapping up this week. So you should see some more forthcoming once their seasons are completed. Great. I remember uh, bowling and swimming started in December and the other sports started in February. Good job. Very good. Moving on to our consent agenda, which is pages uh, uh, three through five, I believe. Uh, yes. I'll read that re uh, resolution <clears throat> that upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the consent agenda be accepted by the Board of Education. I move the resolution. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Fitzpatrick. Any discussion? Didn't know that we had snowshoes. <laughs> they use them at Staley quite often. They actually, yeah, quite a bit. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Yes, it's moving on to the regular agenda, which starts on uh, page six. Uh, finance, uh, we've already uh, heard quite a bit about finance. Is there any additional thing? We, we do have a, uh, a next committee meeting scheduled for the 13th of April. And we have some, I believe some finance items under well, I guess they were on the consent agenda. Yeah, uh, Paul, we, uh, I don't know if it was mentioned, with our treasury report for, for the most recent month should be in, hopefully we'll be getting it tomorrow. For those of you that are looking for it with bated breath. And then, <laughs> and, then, and then do we want to talk about the budget retreat now? Probably a good time. Yeah. We should probably talk about both, right? The retreat and when our first public meeting. I don't recall what our timeline was or if we're still on track. Well, the, the presentation is next board meeting. Okay. Time to bust out those calendars, friends. Yeah, so we discussed uh, the need for one final budget retreat and checking uh, following the uh, regular other board members if next, what would, be, what would be a good day next week, if it'd be Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, whatever, whatever works for everybody. Well, we've been doing them on Wednesday, so that's tough for me. Yeah. It works for works for any any day works for me, so I have no problem. Uh, while you're looking at your calendars, just a quick update. And the reason why this came about is, if you can recall, at the last budget retreat, the, there were some questions asked by the board uh, that were really really good and things that would be affected by the budget. So uh, we needed some time to do some work on that and need to get together one more time just to shore up uh, what we want to present publicly in a couple of weeks. Just for anyone that wasn't sure why the question was posed. I would be better to do next Monday or Tuesday, but I would ask that we make it at six. Tuesday doesn't work for me. I can't do Monday. Um, <laughs> I can't do Monday either. No Monday for me. Can we do Thursday after the policy meeting? Thursday's good for me. So those of us are. What time is the policy meeting? I put in here that we were going to come in at three. three. Is that right? Yeah, I've got three. And I didn't write it down. We'd like to say at least 90 minutes. So can you do that long of a haul? Jonathan, can you do that long of a haul if we do Thursday? Sure. What time on Thursday? 
four thirty or five? Is that too early for everybody else? I mean, if we're already here at three, I don't want to cut us off. Or, or... Okay. Can I make four thirty or five? Five is better for me. I know people work. You, we can ask Don to come later too. We don't have to do policy at three or stay later. He, he usually yeah. is here till five anyways. So if we did 3.30 to five, I think Jonathan's concern was an hour might yeah. not be enough. So if we did, so we'll shift policy to 3.30. So that allows us a little cushion and a break between the two if needed. I'll let you know if he's not able to just stay till five, but I'm, he's usually- the schedule should only happen if it's not gonna cost us more money. No, nope. Peter just said he normally stays till five. Yeah, you're, 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 yeah but if we ask him to, is that different? <laughs> not different when I asked Jason Evangelist to schedule a meeting for him at six at Holland Patton. <laughs> so then he stays here to have to go there. Uh, uh, it's like tag teaming. We know the game. We know how to make it work. Very clever. I'll either ask Dr. Belair at Whitesboro or Jason over at Holland Patton to schedule a meeting for Don next Thursday night at six. We got it covered. All right, so we're your move. Oh, you already did it, Paul. Okay, 3.30 to 5. And then thank you, everyone. And that already took that out of the way. So, so the retreat would be at 5 or 6? 5 p.m. if people are available. Five. Okay, very good. Uh, moving on in the regular agenda to uh, facilities. Uh, do we have anything there? If not, we can uh, I have one quick facilities question. I know he's not here tonight, but did we get a response? Where are our kids playing football? Was it decided? Um, so two things, they've been practicing on the field. Uh, and then I think yesterday and then today, uh, we used our water cannons to water the field to help melt the snow and the <laughs> sun and the heat. So hopefully uh, we'll see that melt off pretty quickly. Excellent. They have been on the field practicing in the snow. I heard they said that they hoped if they tromped it down enough, it would melt on these warm days. But, you know, those kids were really excited to play, yeah. <laughs> especially the seniors. They really want to play out play there. Too, actually. Yeah. The water's not going to freeze this weekend, is it? It's supposed to get cold again. Well, we only, we didn't flood the field because if you flood it and it freezes, you destroy it. We put the water cans on it for about 15 minutes, just enough to try and get some melt off started with the, if we can get the turf exposed, it'll radiate from underneath and, and be okay. So I know uh, Mike Stamboli and the facilities department were on that. I haven't seen what it looks like today. Probably see a good idea tomorrow how much melt off we may have gotten. Very good. Okay. For educational programs. Who would like to take that one? I can read I that. I can up. do it. Okay. Educational programs. I had to make sure my mic was on. All right. Uh, action items. Uh, resolution to approve waiver. Resolved that upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the board of education hereby approves the New York State Education Department Office of Special Education Innovative Program Waiver for the preschool special education programming model. I move the resolution. Moved and seconded by, I'll second it. Any discussion? I have a question, could somebody briefly, what? What's the change associated with this model? Can oh God, I never the to look major at change. Uh, it was uh, a description was in the update last week. The the bottom line is this is a waiver that would allow us to operate a co-taught special education pre preschool or pre kindergarten not preschool pre kindergarten classroom with one teacher in the room that's duly certified in special education and uh, early childhood education as opposed to two teachers uh, with the separate certificates. So essentially it will allow you to operate a special education pre-kindergarten classroom uh, at half the cost as a traditional uh, special education co-taught classroom. It's not a guarantee that uh, you're gonna do it that way. It gives you the flexibility to do it that way. There aren't many duly certified special education, early childhood education teachers out there 
But if you can find them, it saves us uh, anywhere from fifty to eighty thousand dollars per classroom. Uh, will allow us to also start operating the pre-K uh, program within the grant that's provided by the state, and not having to expend general fund dollars to uh, operate the program every year. So, do we have a current uh, program like this with uh, with two teachers? Uh, we do not currently. We did, or we did prior to last year. Uh, we're trying to reinstate some services for kids. Uh, and this is the one way we can do it within the cost of the grant. Traditionally, the district spends anywhere from $500,000 to $600,000 out of the general fund to operate the pre-K program because the grant funding uh, does not support the, we talk about this every budget year, the grant funding does not support the program in totality. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Carried. Mr. Fitzpatrick. Okay. Um, item two, resolution to approve the 2021-2022 school calendar. Resolve that upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education hereby approves the school calendar for the 2021-2022 school year. I move the resolution. Moved and seconded by second. Mr. Malachi. Any discussion? I, I had a, I'm sorry, I had a question when I looked at it about spring break. That's why I was trying desperately here to bring it back up. Usually we're off on Good Friday. Which one is Easter weekend in there? I mean, I see an extra day tacked on, but it's a Monday and I'm confused. Is Easter that year that Easter is the 10th or the 17th that year? Easter is the fourth this year. I no, yeah, hang, yeah, yeah, but it's always your 40 weeks thing. So hold on. April 17th, I believe. Next year we're talking about yeah. April 17th. 17th next year. Oh, you're talking about, there you go. Okay, so that's, so they're attacking the Monday. I mean, we just traditionally, Good Friday is the holiday, right? So we usually have the Friday off and then the following week. This one is the week off and then the following Monday. So they're still giving the extra day. Okay. I was just befuddled by the Monday. Okay, thank you. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Carried. Oh my God. Anything on educate anything else on educational programs? Thank you, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Moving on to people operations. Ms. Lothran. I'll read it for, you're good. Go ahead. Uh, people operations action items number oh. one, resolution to appoint non-instructional staff probationary. Resolve that upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the board of education hereby approves the following non-instructional probationary appointment. Uh, Mariah Mays, teacher aide one-to-one Strau and a salary of 14,510 prorated effective date, March 8, 2021 to nine, 7 2021 Morgan Wyant, uh, teacher aide one to one Denti, salary 14,510 prorated from March 15th, 2021 to September 14th, 2021. And Josh Armstrong, custodial worker, uh, DWF, Dis district, -wide float. district wide float, at a salary of $15.07 uh, per hour, second shift, Monday through Friday at uh, Staley. Uh, and the effective date, March 29, 2021 to September 28, 2021. I move the resolution. Moved and seconded by? Second. Okay, by Mr. Nash. Any discussion? Just, I have a question, Peter. Um, these two aides, are they working through the summer? Is that why it's 9-7-21? It's a six month probationary period. Even well, yep. Well, if they're a one to one aid, that indicates their support learning is a good chance they're going to have to work okay. through the summer as well. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Carried. Mr. Malachi? Yes, number two, resolution to accept retirements. Resolved that upon the recommendation of the su superintendent of schools, the Board of Education hereby accepts with regret the retirement of the following individuals. Carmel Zamudski, teacher assistant RFA, effective date uh, 
August 8, 2021. Sheila Pelton, teacher assistant, Bellamy, effective date, October 8, 2021. Mary Vincent, teacher assistant. Uh, Early childhood. What's that? Early childhood. Early childhood program, effective date, uh, June 30, 2021. Kathleen Patterson, elementary teacher, Gansport, effective date, June 25th, 2021. Susan Bentley, school counselor, Gansport, effective date, June 30, 2021. And Jeffrey Damaris, building maintenance mechanic, uh, effective date, uh, May 28, 2021. I move the resolution. Moved by Mr. Malachi, seconded by? Second. Any discussion? I just call. Congratulations. Yes. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you and congratulations. Okay. Moving on to the third item. Um, vote. No vote. No vote. Didn't we vote? No. no we <laughs> okay. All in favor? I thought we did. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Carried. Uh, Action item number three, resolution to appoint administrator. Resolved that upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education hereby approves the following administrative appointment. Tanya Davis, uh, different spelling, no relation. <laughs> Assistant principal, 83,500 prorated, effective date March 15, 2021 to March 14, 2024. and move the resolution. Second. Um, and seconded by who? Two of us. Yes. Okay. Any discussion? Mr. Morton, are you still out there? I am. I'm just slow on uh, with that mute button. Okay. I, I probably should have invited you in earlier, but you know, obviously, as the head of people operations, you're free to comment in, on any of these, uh, Jeff. Well, I just want to mention that uh, beyond the, the thanks for those who uh, have served the district and unfortunately are retiring, uh, for us, I uh, am pleased to announce uh, Tanya joining our staff. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work with her uh, for my past uh, three years here in the district. I know some of the other administrators have worked with her quite, uh, quite a bit more. I think she's really going to be a great addition to our staff, uh, to the Stroud community. Uh, and to the students. So I'm really excited to, to welcome Tanya on board. The confusion it may create. She must be awesome. <laughs> Wait, I it for free. <laughs> it could end up really good sometimes and really bad sometimes. So <laughs> depends on who you click on the email address. You can always just say it's a mistake now. Right, I could be like, I, I didn't get that. And you must have sent it to the wrong Tanya. <laughs> Very good. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And Tanya will be starting next week. Is that correct, Jeff? Yes. Monday, right? She'll be in uh, tomorrow to do some paperwork, and she's starting Monday. The Ides Very of March. Good. Mm. Where? Thank you. Okay, action item number four. Resolution to terminate employee uh, resolve that upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education hereby terminates the following individual due to job abandonment. Uh, Richard Presky, district-wide flow custodial worker, effective date, February 24, 2021. I move the resolution. Second. Seconded by? Second. By Mr. Fitzpatrick. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Carries. Okay. Action item number five, resolution for involuntary transfer. Resolved that upon the recommendation, recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education hereby approves the following involuntary transfer. Linda McCabe from Steele Elementary to Gansward Elementary, effective date March 8, 2021. I move the resolution. Moved by Mr. Malachi, seconded by? Second. Mr. Fitzpatrick, any discussion? Explain All in favor? Happening. Uh, Hi. Uh, Joe, Joe just asked if we can explain why this is happening. We have a uh, our counselor at Gansavort uh, is will be um, retiring at the end of the year and is currently 
uh, not in the building. So in order to make sure we had a counselor in the building, we have we had three scheduled at Staley. We uh, transferred one to Gansworth to ensure that they had a full-time individual in the building all the time uh, and help make that transition for those students so everybody was covered. Uh, in the next two resolutions, you'll see a uh, resolution to create a counselor district-wide float. That's to backfill the opening at Staley. And there's a resolution to abolish a counselor's position uh, come July 1st. That is the counselor that will be retiring at the end of the year. So you can kind of see the accounting of, we will not have any additional positions uh, of counselors come July, uh, but just some of the things we have to do to uh, get from here to July and make sure our bases are covered for the kids. Yes, my only question, Peter, is I thought when we were in personnel or people operations, I thought she was volunteering to be able to get into work. Uh, she's not, it's not a total volunteer piece. It's an involuntary transfer because the district is requesting her to go. Okay. Gotcha. So she's not going like with her heels dug in. No. So legalese can sometimes sound right. a little yeah. worse than it yeah. actually is. Yeah. <laughs> You're not putting her in a van and driving. <laughs> This is your desk. Uh, I don't think that happened. <laughs> the transportation aidable. We'll start doing it next time. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. Go ahead. Uh, we need to vote on that. All That's in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passed. Action item six: Resolution to create positions. Resolved that upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the board of education hereby creates the following positions: school counselor, district-wide float, senior office specialist, supported learning. I move the resolution. Moved and seconded by Mr. Back Fitzpatrick. <laughs> any, <laughs> any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Carries. Action item number seven, resolution to abolish positions. Resolved that upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education hereby abolishes the following positions. School counselor effective July 1, 2021. Office specialist supported learning 12 months, eight hours a day. I move the resolution. Moved by Mr. Malachi, uh, seconded by Second. Mr. Fitzpatrick. Any discussion? I'm All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries. And action item number eight resolution to appoint Ball to coach. Resolved that upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education hereby appoints the following fall to coach with prorated salary to be determined based on memorandum of agreement with the union. Uh, Nicholas Jarrer, boys and girls assistant indoor track coach at a salary of 4,169, effective date March 12, 2021. I move the resolution. Moved by Mr. Malachi, seconded by Mr. Fitzpatrick. <laughs> You can All take advantage of me. You're the only one I can see, Paul. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Carries. Okay, that completes the uh, our resolutions. Uh, do we have anything else for discussion under people operations? If not, there's a next committee meeting scheduled for Monday, April 12th at 5 p.m. Correct. And we'll move on to policy. Ms. Davis. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, our agenda items are under old business. So I guess, we're, are we gonna roll it all together? Or are we breaking? Well, next meeting date is 3.30 next week. Oh, yeah. Right. Just please amend the next meeting date. It is Thursday, March 18th, but it will be at 3.30. Um, also, we received an, um, a couple of updates today. I wasn't aware that our policy liaison at NISPA had been out sick, so I had been waiting for some responses from her that came as we got to our meeting tonight. Um, so I'll discuss the items specific to policy, but we will be getting... Um, our first segment, the zeros through 1000s of um, their recommended um, improvements um, as we move into the NISPA policy format. Our second installment should be coming sometime in May. Um, they do not have a target date at this point. They, used, they said they used to follow a very specific 
prescribed calendar, January, March, um, July, and September for updates, but now they said they actually do them as um, they have an adequate number to address. So they said we may not see an update at the end of March. So, so we'll keep working through our sections and the items that we have. Very good. Moving on to old business. Uh, would you like to read those, Tanya, since they're your... Well, is there anything miscellaneous? We skipped. Oh, I, I, I just pulled it out. Excuse me. It was in the fold. Do we have anything for miscellaneous business tonight? Just want to make sure. Okay. No? Good. Okay. Um, okay. Old business. We had tabled two items um, due to wanting to clarify some language and to ensure that everyone had read them. Um, some updates were emailed to everyone today. However, as noted on one of these, we did receive um, some, some red lines from NISPA. So um, it is my recommendation that we remove item two from the table and leave item one on the table to make the suggested edits, but I will defer to Mr. Malachi and Mr. Matujic Walda on what you want to do on that. I, I, I personally would prefer to print the two versions and look at them next to each other. Um, what came back is nothing major. It's the student voter policy. And she's essentially saying NISPA's process is to help your manual be much more plain language and less legalese. So she re recommended taking some of the formality out that was in the prior format that we received when this policy was suggested. And since this is a required policy, I really wanna make sure that the language is accurate. Well, I, I think I what I had done with the student voter registration was I, I took the NISPA and, and the BOCES policies and I put them together and I drafted a proposal. And from what I could see uh, as to her recommendation, um, she just took out the headers that I had. Okay, so I was trying to tell if there was an extra paragraph and I was no, struggling. It's essentially the same thing. So it's just, it's the same policy that was distributed to everybody without the statement of policy header and implementation of policy header. Um, and she changed one, she changed one piece of, well, she changed the shells to will, which I know you. <laughs> Makes no difference. Um, at least in this, in this regard. So I don't. And in the first line, she had just come back and said, um, the suggested language had said increased participation in this intrinsically um, significant process and change it to essential process. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's more grammatical. Uh, than substantive, so I think we could probably just go with board, but it's not going to actually assist. If that's how everybody. If the board is comfortable with accepting that as a first read, mm -hmm. and that the final edits will be included in the second read, are we leaving? Works to me. You can make changes between the two. Right. Okay, excellent. Okay, okay. that way we, I don't want to. I don't want to belabor this either because they're fairly simple policies. Yeah. If there was just a gap, and she was out for an extended time and apologized profusely, so. Um, Okay, so I move that we remove, uh, do I have to do them separately, Patty? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, um, I ask for a motion to remove resolution to accept the first reading of policy, I'm sorry, it has a number, 5605, student voter registration from the table. Sorry. Seconded by Mr. Malachi. All in, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh, aye. Um, resolution to accept the first reading of policy 5605 student voter registration. Resolved that upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the first reading of policy 5605 student voter registration be accepted by the Board of Education. I move this. Moved by Ms. Davis, seconded by Second. Mr. Fitzpatrick. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Be opposed? Uh, I move that we remove uh, the next resolution to accept the first reading of policy 2230 appointed board officials from the table. It's been moved, seconded by? Second. John Nash. Mr. Nash. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so both were approved for the first reading. Thank you. Oh, no, that was to remove it from the table. You have to vote it. Oh, one more to go. One more. 
Um, resolution okay. to accept the first reading of policy number 2230 appointed board officials. Resolve that upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the first reading of policy number 2230 appointed board officials be uh, accepted by the Board of Education. I move it. Moved by Mr. seconded by Mr. Fitzpatrick. Oh, that was Mr. Malachi. <laughs> Mr. Malachi. Uh, just as a discussion item, I'm, we're also going to make one minor edit to the line on that. Uh, the last line we had indicated um, all other duties as just as prescribed in the um, civil service job description. They have advised that that is it's not always necessary that that is a civil service role. So uh, the the edited language that you received in your email states just as prescribed by job description. So the item seven. So. Um, okay on the second read that will be corrected. And I also wanna note for everyone that these are, um, we are moving these um, under the new policy numbering format. So if the numbers don't seem to jive with your current policy manual, these are the new chapters as they will be in our updated policy manual. Very good. Now we did vote on that re resolution, is that correct? No, nope. moved and seconded okay. now. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. So again, we have <clears throat> approved both of those resolutions for first reading and- I, I'm sorry, I had one additional policy item. So I know that it was brought up in the personnel committee and I apologize, I was working, I could not make that, but that we're about to move forward with the code of conduct. And I wanted to make sure that someone from our policy committee is engaged with that. And also that we, um, that they have a copy of the recommended NISPA code of conduct to compare because that wasn't available when they started their process. I emailed it a long time ago, but if you don't still have it, I can get it to you. Jeff probably has it. We, we have the attorneys make the edit to our code of conduct. So we generally use what they recommended. Uh, language and format is, but we can ask them to review what's in the NISPA. new the one that came through from NISPA, I believe, includes some of the language about equity. So that's why I was interested to compare the two. And I know that we've yep. had conversations in our personnel, we've had conversations in policy, and we've had uh, conversations on the equity task force about ways that we want that message to be consistent about our equity and diversity, and that all our policies are reflective of that. So, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Okay. Do we have any other business? Just executive session. Okay. Motion to go into executive session. In fact, I move to go into executive sessions for the uh, purpose of contract negotiations and personal related data matters. Uh, moved by Mr. Malachi, seconded by John Matwijic Walla. By John. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We're in executive session there, or we will be when we get our new address. It's not anticipated that we will return, correct? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. You can use the link from Google earlier for executive session. That link is still open. Good night, everybody. Good night. I might have deleted it. If I can't get it back, you might have to send it to me again. Well, I can resend it. I, I, I deleted it too.